its open harbor was totally unprotected. Worse still, the surrounding area was covered with swamps, the perfect breeding ground for killer diseases. The skeleton we see here is a Spaniard who died at the age of 37, most likely of malaria. He was one of the first settlers, and malaria was the most common cause of death at that time here in La Isabella. There were some other diseases like dengue fever around, but most of them really died of malaria. Disease, bad weather, and hunger lead to the first signs of discontent among the settlers. La Isabella is clearly no place for a new city. Columbus travels deeper into the heart of Hispaniola. He heads for the region of Cibao, the source of the island's gold. But Columbus's decision to move inland will turn the native people against him. By now, the Taino realize that the Spaniards are here to stay, and they are clearly not gods, but greedy mortals. They start to fight back. Columbus responds with a fierce campaign of terror. The Taino are forced to submit to his rule. Columbus built a new city in the Cibao to stamp his victory on the land and people. In its time, Concepcion de la Vega will become the richest gold mining center in the Caribbean. La Vega was an example of how the Spanish colonization was becoming successful. They pacified the Indians here and put them to work mining gold and were able to spend that gold on Spanish products and to turn this into a European-style city. It was here in La Vega that many of the nobles who had crossed the Atlantic with Columbus on the second voyage came to settle, driven by the ambition for wealth. The Indians had been happy with the tiny nuggets of gold they plucked from riverbeds. But the Spanish want everything they can get their hands on. Nuggets, ore, and even gold dust. They strip the island of its natural resources. Here at La Vega are the remains of the Spanish gold industry. This is where the Spaniards would have the Taino Indian workers bring the gold ore that they had panned out of the rivers. They could clean it better here and then smelt it and mold it into gold bars that they then stored in the fortress until it was time to ship them back to Spain. In March 1496, confident that his colony had been thoroughly pacified, Columbus brought his second voyage to its end. He returned home a wealthy man, the Admiral of the Ocean Sea, But from now on, the fortunes of his beloved Hispaniola will take a completely different course. Two years later, Columbus returned to the New World on his third voyage. This time his main aim was expansion and exploration. He sailed as far as Venezuela, making him the first European ever to set eyes on the continent of South America. Then the third voyage turned north. In August 1498, Columbus returned to Hispaniola and founded a new capital. He called it Santo Domingo. From here, he became governor of the whole island at the heart of Spain's growing empire in the Caribbean. But Columbus, the master of the sea, is no leader on land. Here, his navigation and sailing skills are of no use. He needs to be a leader of men. His approach will be brutal. Any dissent from either the Taino or Spanish is met with violence as Columbus rules by terror. One of the things that Columbus did was cut people's ears, cut people's noses as punishment for uh, thievery. And he did this both to Spaniards and to the native peoples. The Plaza de Armas in Santo Domingo was the setting for many of Columbus's public mutilations but turning his own people against him would prove to be his downfall. 
Columbus's relations with the Spanish colonists were never good to begin with, and as time went on, they got worse and worse and worse. And the Spanish colonists on Hispaniola were not about to take this treatment lying down. Eventually, a large group of colonists rebel and start setting up their own colonies in the mountains of Hispaniola. Many of them wrote letters back to their relatives and friends in Spain complaining bitterly about the treatment that they were receiving by Columbus and about his governorship of the colony. And the Spanish sovereigns learned of these complaints and they took them seriously. The alarmed monarchs send an envoy to report on the growing crisis on Hispaniola. The conclusion? Columbus is to blame. The man who discovered the new world is imprisoned in his own colony. He returns to Spain branded a criminal. But everyone has underestimated Columbus's ability to fight back. He will win one last chance to prove himself in the toughest venture of them all, his forgotten fourth voyage. Christopher Columbus made his name with the discovery of the New World. But this moment of glory has been followed by a dramatic fall from grace. But now, nearly ten years after he first set foot in the Americas, incredibly, Columbus is about to brave the Atlantic Ocean again. This fourth voyage will be the most controversial and devastating journey of them all. Despite his mismanagement of the New World, despite his returning to Spain in chains, and despite his trial for atrocities, the King and Queen of Spain have forgiven Columbus. They've even agreed to pay for one final voyage. But this hazardous venture is being done on a shoestring. It was a small-scale operation. He had bad ships, inexperienced crew, it was obvious that this was not where the Spanish monarchs were putting their priority. The crew know Columbus is the most experienced Atlantic explorer in the world. But they also know that Columbus is a desperate man. His reputation and finances lie in tatters. This is his last chance to save his name and make his fortune. What's more, the Spanish rulers have changed their original deal with Columbus. Originally, he was going to control exploration of the New World, and he'd get to keep a large share of its profits. Now, all that has changed. The monarchs have given other explorers the right to conquer and colonize, and Columbus won't see a penny. Now, Columbus is yesterday's man. His writings capture his intense bitterness at losing out on the wealth of the new world. I have had my honor and property ruined. Now, even tailors are asking for licenses of exploration. On this fourth voyage, Columbus is traveling with his illegitimate son, 13-year-old Fernando, a former page at the Spanish royal court. Now he aspires to be an explorer like his father. Columbus still dreams of making his fortune, and he still believes that he can find the undiscovered westward passage to Asia. But Columbus is 51, an old man by the standards of the time. He suffers bouts of crippling gout and arthritis. Everyone thinks this will be his last ever voyage. His bold plans already sound as if he is attempting the impossible, to sail right around the world. He really did believe God was speaking to him directly and had an important plan for him. He mentions in a letter written at the time of the fourth voyage that God had given him the keys opening up the Atlantic, the new discoveries. For this wildly ambitious project, Columbus has managed to handpick some key members of his crew. Diego Mendez has joined the fleet as an official clerk, but the fourth voyage will challenge him in a way he can never imagine. Columbus's brother, Bartolome, has also agreed to sail. He's a cartographer trained in Portugal's state-of-the-art center for navigation but he has also been tainted by his time as joint governor of Hispaniola with Columbus. 
accused of much of the brutality on the island.